It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third edition of the Conference on Liver Disease in Africa 2020. This year has been quite challenging due to the COVID-19 crisis. So rather than a face-to-face -face meeting, this special edition of Calder will be a digital experience. There have been major advances despite the COVID-19 challenge, but much more is needed for our continent in Africa to advance care and management of liver disease. My name is Manal al Sayed. I'm a professor of pediatrics and director of the Clinical Research Center at Ain Shams University, and also a board member of the ESL International Liver Foundation and a founding member of the Egyptian National Committee for Control of Viral Hepatitis. I'm co-chairing this conference with Professor Mark Nelson from Imperial College, Professor Charles Boucher from Erasmus University, from the Netherlands, whom we're missing in this meeting, and the local co-chair, Professor Papa Salih Mabai, uh, who's from Principal Hospital in Senegal, the hosting country for Calder this year. The schedule of this meeting will go through the 10th to the 12th of September. It always starts between 2 or 2.30, the Central African time, and the day ends by between 6 to 7 o'clock Central African time. The first day, we have uh, an opening session, uh, and it's going to discuss mainly uh, viral hepatitis. And then the afternoon, we're going to uh, listen to a very important uh, session about prevention of transmission, looking after mother to child with a focus on hepatitis B and the WHO guidelines for prevention of mother to child transmission of hepatitis B. On the second day, it's going to be on management of viral hepatitis, a hepatitis B related, uh, in the early afternoon and in the late afternoon, it's going to be hepatitis C related. There is going to be contribution from Africa and from different parts of the world, as well as WHO. The third and last day, we're going to discuss the NAFL, NASH management in Africa, end stage liver disease and hepatitis care in the COVID-19 pandemic. And these sessions will also include discussions on liver transplantation and hepatocellular carcinoma. But we also didn't forget the abstracts. You have poster viewing and you have abstract presenters. The best abstracts were selected to be presented on days one and two. And there is going to be uh, an oral abstract presentations, two sessions on each day and poster viewing on the second and third days. And you can visit the poster gallery at any time. While we have also contributions from non-governmental organizations, including the Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics, they have a special session on day one uh, in the late afternoon, the International Coalition for Elimination of Hepatitis B on day two in the late afternoon, and also the World Hepatitis Alliance is contributing to a number of sessions during the three days of uh, the Calder meeting. We would like to thank the sponsors for this meeting, uh, namely Abbott and Mylan, uh, for their major contribution. Uh, in fact, this year has been quite challenging uh, and a lot of cancellations for many meetings and the organizing committee had to work very hard to develop this digital version and get some sponsorship from uh, the pharma. But we also have many endorsers for this meeting as uh, for the last two years, and the number of endorsers are increasing by the year. As with last year, we had a very nice group photo. Uh, this, uh, this year, we're going to have a sort of a virtual edition. We would ask you to take your own photo and send it to Virology Education. Then the photo will be stitched uh, all together and sent out uh, as a finished virtual group photo at the end of the conference. 
uh, to be something that's similar to last year's uh, group photo. We hope that you enjoy this meeting, but we also need your feedback. Your feedback is really important. After each session, please take a minute to complete the pop-up questionnaire. After the conference, a survey will be sent out to you by email. Please reply to this as well. Your feedback is very valuable and helps the organizing committee to further improve the conference program. We connect also uh, on social media, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and of course, the virology educational team has done an exceptional effort to be able to make this meeting or this digital meeting happen. So uh, I would really like you all to remember that there is a big team behind this, uh, Karen, uh, Ricky, Wilco, uh, Zara, and many others who have hard to make this digital meeting successful. And we're very thankful for their huge efforts to advance the care and management of liver disease in Africa. Thank you and have a great meeting. So it, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first session today, and uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Fiumi Lassi from WHO, Congo, Brazzaville. She will present on viral hepatitis B and C elimination in 2030. Uh, professor Lassi is a professor of medicine at the College of Medicine University of Lagos, Nigeria, an honorary consultant gastroenterologist, She's a regional advisor for viral hepatitis at the WHO Regional Office for Africa, and she provides uh, and coordinates technical support for development of national strategies and policies related to hepatitis epidemiology, prevention, and management, in addition to proactively contributing to enhancing the regional profile of viral hepatitis. Professor Lassie. Um, first, as we start, I would like to thank the organizing committee for CODA 2020. Um, in this COVID era, it is really challenging and we commend CODA for the conference. So my talk will be on viral hepatitis B and C elimination by 2030. And of course, we know that this is towards a hepatitis free future. Um, the outline as stated will start with why viral hepatitis is a public health threat and we'll look at the global hepatitis strategy and the targets and the status of elimination and some lessons we can learn from countries that have adopted the strategy and then moving forward within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this slide shows that indeed Chronic hepatitis has become a threat to public health. And there are three important points to highlight as we start. And one is the significant global burden of viral hepatitis affecting over 320 million people. And you would see the status of hepatitis B afflicting more than 250 million people with the predominance in the Western Pacific and Africa region. And then we can look at the status of hepatitis C affecting 71 million people. Together, the two infections exceed the HIV epidemic by more than 10 times. The second important point is the rising death rates from liver cancer and cirrhosis. And in the table below, in yellow, we can see the death rate from viral hepatitis and 1.34 million hepatitis deaths were estimated in 2015. And projections suggest that if nothing is done, by the time we reach 2040, the death rate from viral hepatitis will exceed the combination of HIV, TB, and malaria deaths. Importantly, innovations in diagnostic tools, innovations in treatment for hepatitis B and cure for hepatitis C have transformed the landscape of viral hepatitis, making elimination a reality. Now, in response to this threat, the World Health Assembly has endorsed the global health sector strategy 
for elimination of viral hepatitis by 2030. And this is particularly important if we look at the vision of a world where hepatitis transmission is stopped and everyone, leaving no one behind, has access to safe and effective treatment and care. I know that the next speaker will actually speak to the issue of access that is a limiting concern for viral hepatitis. Now, the global strategy has five strategic directions and priorities. And importantly, it has set out ambitious impact targets in line with the sustainable development goal. And of course, we know that health and sustainable development are intricately linked together. Now, the framework established is similar to what we see with other common infectious diseases, and it's based on a public health approach. And I'd like to repeat that. This public health approach has not been previously used in viral hepatitis, but it's been used in some of these global health concerns like TB and HIV, where we have decentralization and affordable, available care. Another important framework is universal health coverage, where everyone has access to care without financial hardship. And if we look at this graph, the impact targets for hepatitis eliminations are, number one, to reduce incidence by 90%. This means that of 10 million infections in 2015, the target is to reach less than 1 million by 2030. In terms of mortality as well, 1.3 million deaths in 2015 to reach less than half a million deaths by 2030. So we're looking at elimination as a public health threat. So if you look at the five service coverage targets, four of them are on prevention indicators, and one is majorly on hepatitis B and C testing and treatment. The table shows baseline at 2015. It shows 2020 targets and what is anticipated by 2030. Now, WHO has produced guidance for hepatitis in different contexts. And all of this is available to support the hepatitis elimination ranging from hepatitis B guidelines and C guidelines, and even reporting and surveillance. In July 2020, during World Hepatitis Day, the, the latest guidelines for using antiviral medicines in the context of preventing mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B was released. And of course, guidelines and guidance is still work in progress. WHO is working also on looking at certification and validation of viral hepatitis elimination. And this is particularly important as remember that this week, the Africa region has celebrated polio eradication. This has been certified and such certification of public health priorities are really ongoing for various diseases. In terms of the progress reports, we would look at the state of elimination globally, and this will be done in this presentation using this traffic light system reporting, where the green shows where we are on track, and the red shows areas where little or no progress has been made. The yellow color will range in between incomplete and minor actions or incomplete major actions. So the first thing we look at is the national strategic planning. Of course, we know that without a plan, it becomes difficult to plan a response strategy. But the, some action has been taken in developing national strategic plans for viral hepatitis that is aligned with the global strategy. And um, as of February 2019, 124 countries had national plans. Many of them are in the draft stage and very few are funded. 
On the right are examples of plants from various countries, including Australia, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. So the question is, where are we now with some of the core interventions for viral hepatitis prevention? Now this slide shows the four prevention interventions, and you would see that on track are things related to injection safety in healthcare. The hepatitis B childhood vaccination is on track. However, Timely birth dose is incomplete and in harm reduction, little progress has been made to date. Um, this slide looks at the hepatitis B surface antigen prevalence post-vaccination. Another achievement in the past month is the identification of the achievement of reaching the 2020 target of a hepatitis B surface antigen prevalence less than 1% globally. This is a major achievement. But you would see that the achievement is uneven. And low income countries and some middle income countries have prevalence still above 2% in children under two years old. This is a significant achievement globally because we know that this will translate to less liver cancer and less liver cirrhosis in future, as we know that in hepatitis B, children have a very susceptible means of route of infection and chronicity. The graph shows that many of these countries that are yet to reach the global target are in the Africa region. In terms of testing and treatment for hepatitis B and C, where are we now? This slide shows the cascade of care for hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And together, we can see that although there is a large burden of infected people, there's a huge gap, a 70% gap in diagnosis and a similar gap in treatment. And this cuts across both hepatitis B and C. Now this slide is interesting and really it is highlighting some of our experience in Africa of four essential program components in viral hepatitis B and C treatment between the years 2015 and 2020. Four issues are highlighted in terms of policy, in terms of service delivery using a public health approach. And this approach has been brought to scale in two countries majorly, and this is in Rwanda. And of course, we know in Egypt as well, but also Uganda has started a hepatitis B campaign. In terms of strategic information and surveillance, this is a, a huge gap. And WHO has supported hepatitis surveillance in, in um, Cameroon, in Nigeria, in Uganda, in Tanzania, and in South Africa. But there is still a lot of work to be done in bringing hepatitis surveillance up to scale. In terms of domestic funding, this has been done only in two or three countries in the region. So we look at the major challenges to reach elimination, and we're talking about lack of data and planning, lack of engagement, funding, lack of action. And this has to begin with mounting sufficient advocacy for action. And that was demonstrated during the 2020 global talk show that was hosted by WHO that brought political advocacy to many parts of the world. In terms of moving forward, some countries are on track for elimination and there are some lessons that can be learned from these countries going forward. And this is identified as key success factors and includes high level political commitment, public funding of hepatitis programs, the importance of 
social mobilization and community engagement is actually being brought to fore even now during the, hepatitis, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, decentralization of services is critical and then sensitization and capacity building of healthcare workers. A differentiated testing strategy has been identified as important in promoting elimination. Now, with the COVID pandemic, this table from WHO Corona Disease Dashboard shows that as of August 27th, over 24 million confirmed cases and over 800,000 COVID-19 deaths have been reported to WHO. And some of the modeling of the potential impact of disruption to hepatitis B vaccination programs for child, for children and infant seems to portend significant increases in infections of hepatitis B and liver cancer if no adjustment is made. Now this graph shows that with 60% disruption and delayed recovery, more than 5.3 million new cases of hepatitis B may be recorded and 1 million additional deaths from liver cancer and liver cirrhosis may be identified in the next decade or two. So COVID has really brought up major challenges services for prevention, treatment, and care has been disrupted. Logistics supply chains have been interrupted. And of course, limited financial and human resources have been diverted to the COVID response, including the political focus shifting. And of course, all of this is rightly, rightly so. But this would mean that we have lost a lot of hepatitis advocacy and ground and implementation built over the past five years. However, the major challenges to COVID can produce and present opportunities to build back better. And some of the ways in which we can build back better is highlighted here, including innovations in delivery of services, including community literacy and community engagement and decentralization of services through primary care. So in summary, amidst a world affected with COVID-19, elimination of hepatitis remains critical to ensure a hepatitis-free future. And some important things as in closing the gaps in implementation, awareness, resource mobilization, and promoting a major partnership are important. So we need to build back better in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And to sum it up, what I'd like to say is we need to think big. Beyond one country, beyond one region, we need to think global. But we start where we are. We start small. And this is the time to start. We start now. And um, I wish to thank you for the opportunity to present. And I applauded colleagues who have supported this development of this presentation and the various references used. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Fiumi, for this excellent presentation. Uh, let the, uh, uh, so I would like the audience to know that there is going to be a panel discussion at the end of this session. So uh, after you hear the speakers, uh, you are going to uh, click on uh, the right side of the panel uh, to be able to access uh, the panel discussion. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Oriel Fernandez uh, from Chai, Indonesia, will present on access to treatment in Africa. Uh, Oriel is the Associate Director of Country Support Planning and Operations for the Viral Hepatitis Program at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Okay, hello to everyone signing on virtually to this session. It is a pleasure to be part of the opening session of COLDA 2020. And while we cannot be in person together, 
I want to thank the organizing committee for finding creative ways in which we can connect virtually to share the lessons we've learned on preventing, diagnosing, and treating viral hepatitis in Africa. Given the time constraints, I'll be focusing my presentation today on scaling up access to hepatitis C testing and treatment, which is where CHAI has really focused our support over the last few years. And I'll use some examples of countries in the region and compare some of the common elements of success across these countries. So just to provide some context up front, CHAI initiated a viral hepatitis program in 2015, and we're currently supporting ministries of health across seven countries to scale up hepatitis C treatment, including two countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Rwanda and Nigeria. Our approach really focuses at two levels. At a global level, we work with governments, drug and diagnostic suppliers and partners to enable market shaping, which involves gathering and disseminating market intelligence and negotiating significant price reductions for drug and diagnostics commodities. At a country level, we work with ministries and partners to develop and implement the key building blocks of national programs with an eye towards them scaling naturally as programs mature. Our goal overall is to help countries catalyze rapid HCV treatment scale up to reach HCV elimination goals. And we've seen firsthand how countries like Rwanda have grown its HCV program from launch, taking really a step-by-step -step approach, developing optimal strategies to rapidly scale testing and treatment. Fortunately, there have been significant developments in the global HCV landscape over the last five years that has made HCV elimination an achievable goal. This slide lays out some of those key highlights. The change in the clinical landscape, for example, has enabled a simplified public health approach for HCV that allows for the simplification and decentralization of HCV services. On the testing front, we have a number of quality assured test kits for screening and multiple lab-based and near point of care diagnostic platforms for HCV viral load testing, which allows us to decentralize our case finding and linkage to care strategies. On the treatment front, the use of pangenotypic drugs means that programs no longer need genotype testing, they can eliminate on-treatment viral load monitoring, and that fewer clinical uh, visits are now required for patients. More recently, we're seeing exciting developments in the pediatric treatment landscape and more cross-country collaboration and data sharing to address emerging critical questions in the HCV elimination agenda, like how do lower and middle income countries make decisions on DAA retreatment options without access to highly priced soft bell locks, the WHO recommended regimen. Given these developments, many countries have developed national scale up plans for viral hepatitis uh, and are scaling up treatment for hepatitis C. With increase in volumes, G uh, generic DAA prices have declined significantly with suppliers offering very low prices to countries committing to rapid scale up. On the financing side, while we do not have one big donor for fueling a ton of funding into the HCV elimination response, we have seen some progress. Countries like Rwanda, for example, are increasing domestic commitments for HCV elimination. The Global Fund has been increasingly funding HIV co-infection programs and harm reduction services. And Egypt, who is leading the way in HCV elimination, is offering financial and technical assistance for HCV elimination in the region. So really remarkable developments in a very short time. So just to hone in on treatment access from a pricing standpoint, as you can see from the graphic on the slide, there has been significant declines in the pricing for DAAs. Before 2014, pre-DAAs, the price of treatment was over $3,000 per patient course. In 2014, when DAAs came into the picture, innovator access pricing dropped to around $750 per patient course. Currently, with the availability of generic products, the benchmark for DAA pricing has fallen further. For example, the Global Fund and the UNDP procurement mechanisms reference prices as low as $79 to $94 for soft DAC. Finally, Rwanda has been able to secure a $60 per patient treatment course price, 
uh, when the government committed to HCV elimination. And this is now the new benchmark price for a full WHO pre-qualified treatment course. I'll talk in a little bit about Rwanda's experience. It's important that all stakeholders have access to this pricing. And so in May, CHAI released the first ever HCV market report to increase market transparency, to mitigate market barriers, and support progress towards HCV elimination. The report provides a source for HCV market information that is now publicly available, provides information on historical volumes and pricing trends, and suggests potential ways in which countries can access diagnostics and drugs at more affordable prices. So a number of countries in Africa, like Egypt, Rwanda, and Nigeria, have built upon these global developments to launch and scale HCV testing and treatment. Egypt, Rwanda, and Nigeria are in very different stages of their elimination programs. And the scale uh, of the burden and the epidemic looks very different country by country. So each country is taking a different pathway to scale up testing and treatment. In Nigeria, for example, while the national HCV prevalence rate is around 1.1%, some states like Nasarawa have a much higher burden. And so Nigeria has started with state-wise mobilization of HCV programming with Nasarawa State leading the way. Rwanda has taken a phased approach to starting with screening amongst people living with HIV and is now rapidly decentralizing services nationwide to reach HCV elimination goals. And Egypt has demonstrated strong political will and commitment and is facing, uh, facilitating mass nationwide screening and treatment scale up. So despite the differences in program scale up, there are common elements that we can draw on from each of these program experiences that can help shape some lessons for other countries in the region. CHAI has partnered with Nigeria and Rwanda since close to the beginning of their programs. And I'll deep dive now into each of these country experiences next. So let's start with Rwanda. Rwanda is a chai supported country that has fast-tracked its commitment to HCV elimination with the target for doing so by 2022. Rwanda has built its program on the principles of simplification, integration, decentralization, and task shifting, and is on track to be the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to eliminate HCV. Rwanda, when developing its program, uses a stepwise approach to scale up the national program. Following the introduction of DAAs and development of clinical guidelines, the Ministry of Health using available resources started with screening of patients within the ART cohort. Then using the screening data to highlight high prevalence within the cohort, Rwanda was able to secure some additional resources from the Global Fund for viral load tests and drugs to treat and cure people co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C. Rwanda then expanded its program further to high burden districts and populations. Uh, these efforts have now culminated into Rwanda announcing an HCV elimination program and uh, committing to treat over 100,000 patients uh, at the end of 2018. Rwanda has leveraged this commitment to secure competitive pricing for drugs and diagnostics and is now rapidly decentralizing services down to the health center level to meet its HCV elimination targets. In fact, earlier this year, every district in Rwanda has committed to screen over 130,000 people to help the country screen 4 million people by the end of the year, uh, and the country is on track to do so. Overall, Rwanda's experience has demonstrated that political will with clear planning and evidence-based interventions, starting with high burden populations and leveraging existing infrastructure, along with strong partnerships, are key elements needed for an HCV elimination program. Now, moving on to Nigeria. Nigeria is in an earlier stage of its HCV elimination program, with states like Nasarawa State really forging the pathway for broader national scale-up. As I said before, Nasarawa State has double-digit HCV serum prevalence rates, which is significantly higher than the country average, which is why CHAI initially honed in our support within this state. So once the federal government um, program was launched, uh, the Nasarawa State Ministry established a state viral hepatitis focal point in 2016 and phased in treatment um, 
programs, uh, which focused on one, expanding diagnostics access through the integration of HCV viral load testing on existing gene expert platforms uh, in the state. Two, scaling up treatment to an initial 10 facilities with a focus on provider initiated treatment and counseling, which is very critical in a state where patients have to pay out of pocket for their own treatment. And three, Nasarawa State also expanded case finding to primary health facilities and in the process has been negotiating competitive drug and diagnostics pricing for the program. In 2019, building off these efforts, Nasarawa State government committed to develop, uh, developing an HCV elimination strategy for the region and has developed a five-year elimination costed plan. This plan helps introduce a line for hepatitis elimination in the 2020 state budget and it sets the stage for the launch and scale up of services to an estimated 200,000 patients uh, living with HCV in Nasarawa. The elimination plan now leverages a phased approach similar to Rwanda, prioritizing HIV patients by building upon existing service delivery and generating evidence for further program scale up. Nasarawa's experience is demonstrating similar elements to what we're seeing in Rwanda, developing state infrastructure through the integration of services to accelerate access to diagnostics and treatment, and now strategically expanding the program into an elimination program with the government um, committing to some initial catalytic funding. So just to conclude this presentation, um, collective learnings can be drawn from the experiences of countries like Rwanda and Nigeria for other countries who are looking at launching and scaling up public programs. We've seen that countries who are further ahead in their elimination programs have taken a stepwise approach to building evidence of the local disease burden and gathering uh, political commitment by targeting high risk groups first. Uh, they have leveraged opportunities for integration building upon existing health infrastructure, secured government commitment and political leadership to catalyze the efforts, leveraged current market information to negotiate and secure affordable prices for drugs and diagnostics early in the program, used existing local and international partnerships to support the elimination agenda. Um, and these are elements that are not just common uh, within countries like Rwanda and Nigeria. We've seen these same elements in countries in Asia that we support as well. Maybe just two last comments before I end. You know, while I didn't address HBV in this presentation, it's important to recognize that the elements of strong HCV elimination programs uh, do lay the foundations for expansion of HBV testing and treatment as well. Rwanda, for example, has been including HPV screening within its screening campaigns. Additionally, the availability of effective and affordable HPV vaccines, including the critical birth dose, and the release of the new WHO guidelines to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HPV present the opportunity to integrate HPV services for pregnant women uh, and their newborns as an essential health service uh, and a it presents a clear pathway to achieving an HPV free generation. In fact, countries in Africa who have strong HIV PMTCT programs can and should build upon these programs to introduce HPV screening and treatment for pregnant women. And finally, we know that many countries are now faced um, with the unprecedented uh, COVID-19 pandemic and their responses to the pandemic. But we must also ensure that momentum in the scale up uh, for viral hepatitis elimination programs and other health priorities is not lost. In fact, action towards controlling the COVID-19 pandemic can reinforce the fight against other epidemics. For example, COVID-19 investments can be leveraged to expand integrated diagnostics capacity and digital platforms. We've come so far in the last five years and while there's still a number of hurdles countries need to uh, get over to rapidly scale up viral hepatitis programs, countries like Egypt, Rwanda, and Nigeria are demonstrating that these hurdles are not insurmountable. So with that, I will end my presentation here and pass it over to the session chair. Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks, Oriel, for uh, this great presentation. And uh, now it's my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce uh, the local chair of Calder 2020, Professor Papa uh, Salomubai from Senegal. And uh, even though we're not able to meet face to face in Senegal, uh, alas, uh, we will inform you. Uh, 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 he will inform you about the local situation of liver disease in Senegal. Uh, Professor Mabai uh, is from Department of Hepatology and Gastroenterology, Principal Hospital, Dakar, Senegal. Uh, he's also the former president of the African Society of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Endoscopy. Professor Mabai. Dear friends, dear colleagues, I thank you, and I want to talk today of the status of liver diseases in Senegal. Liver diseases are a public health issue in our country due to the high incidence of viral hepatitis. The prevalence of that viral hepatitis varies according to viruses and geographical areas in Africa. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C viruses that are predominant in Africa have two different profiles in Senegal. In which country does exist a national hepatitis elimination program? As for hepatitis B, we can see here that Senegal is located in hepatitis B, high prevalence areas in sub-Saharan Africa, where the prevalence rate is superior to 8%. We can also see that in Senegal, the two predominant genotypes are genotype E and genotype A. Various studies from 1973 showed the high incidence of this B viral infection in Senegal between 11 and 17 percent, but the last survey conducted into 2017 and 2016 gave the prevalence rate varies around 12 percent. Let's also say that 85 percent of the population before the year 2000 had contact with the hepatitis B virus. And when we study the co-infection between hepatitis B and HIV, it is between 8.8% and 16.8% according to the various studies, but we can see that it doesn't change. HIV infection is acquired during early adult age. At that moment, the serological status vis-a-vis HBV is already set in the patient. And when we study the pre prevalence survey among children, we can see that before the year 2000, prevalence among children was around 12%. From, from 15 years old, the prevalence in children was between 11 and 15%, and that was the, for the adult. Above 15 years, prevalence didn't increase anywhere. This recent study confirmed by another study by IRD showed that currently from the start of hepatitis B vaccination, the prevalence of this infection has decreased significantly. In this study, it is about 1.1% and only 4.5% of children have positive anti-HBC antibodies this had contact with hepatitis B virus. We can see that 77% had anti-HBS antibodies that is a profile of vaccinated but unfortunately only 56 had protective percentage of anti-HBS antibodies superior to 10 UI. Transmission of this viral infection in Senegal occurs mainly by horizontal and perinatal way, more often between the age of 2 years and 12 years, or from birth given the close contact between mother and the child when the mother is infected by the virus. Horizontal transmission occurs either through parents or one family member infected by the virus. As for mortality due to hepatitis in Senegal, if we refer to Global Scan 2018, there were 1,083 deaths. Thus, hepatitis B infection, liver cancer is the second type of cancer in Senegal among men and third type of cancer for women. Let's point out that those data are maybe underestimated due to the lack of cancer registry in many countries. In the country, there is no national cancer registry. Therefore, those deaths are also underestimated due to the fact that deaths from severe hepatitis and cirrhosis were not counted. 
this what it, the profile of hepatitis B chronic carriers in Senegal. When we want to conduct an initial evaluation, we face restriction due to the feasibility of epic function test among most patients because of the limited access to molecular tests. The evaluation of the DNA viral rate, that is the molecular test, is extremely expensive for most patients. Sometimes also they cannot access to morphological test enabling to check liver shape. In this survey conducted by Dr. Salamate Jallo, out of 728 patients HBV infected, there were 7 cases of acute hepatitis, 442 cases of chronic infection by this virus, and mainly 161 cirrhotic and 118 cases of hepatocellular carcinoma. Patients are screened at cirrhosis status and liver cancer status for a big percentage of them. Which cases are proposed to those patients? Pegylated interferon is really used due to its very high cost, but also criteria for good response to interferon are not compatible with our patients who suffer from chronic infections and for whom we know that interferon is much more efficient in case of recent infection and also our patients have very low activity. We know that for its humino-modulating action to be efficient, it's necessary to have sufficient activity in the liver. On the other hand, that nicolotid analogs, which are mainly used, namely tenofovir, diproxyl, fumarate, subsidized by the government for a cost of 10 euro per month, available in reference health facilities. We don't have TAF and and Tecavir is scarcely used on patients showing contraindications to tenofovir, mainly those suffering from kidney disorder. What about vaccination, which must be our most important weapon, the most used one? It is available in Senegal since 1999. In 2004, this vaccine integrated the expanded humanization program. Unfortunately, it is a pentavalent vaccine taken at six weeks, which is not ideal. On the other hand, since 2016, the vaccine monovalent anti-HBV is available and is taken at birth. The vaccination rate at birth in December 2018 was estimated to 82%. As for hepatitis C virus, its presence is very low, much less frequent than HBV. The seroprevalence we have is mainly around 1.4% and 1.6%. Of course, very high among the hemodialysis patients, also very high among injected drug users. Which treatment do we propose to those patients? In our country, genotype 2 is most too common. Even before the advent of AADs, we were using interferon and ribavirin. This association healed nearly all genotype 2 patients infected by hepatitis C. Currently, direct action antivirals are available but are not accessible because of their very high cost. Then, due to the low prevalence of hepatitis C in our country, pharmacy laboratories are not present and drugs are ordered in Côte d'Ivoire, Abidjan with mainly Sophosbivir and Velfapastib. All the liver diseases are scarce, alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune liver disease also scarce. However, fatty liver disease in all countries is increasing. But our priority currently is hepatitis virus, which is mainly the cause of liver cancer, very frequent in our country. As a conclusion, we can say that viral hepatitis is really a public health issue in Senegal, dominated by hepatitis B and mainly morbidity and mortality reaching young patients between 20, 35 and 45 years old. Screening must be done, confronted with accessibility issue for most patients who cannot afford it and mainly the major weapon must be vaccination and we should try to vaccinate the maximum number of people with the birth dose. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mubai and all the speakers for the great presentations. Uh, and now the live panel discussion will start. Uh, to access this, please click on the Zoom link on the right side of the page under session information. Uh, the panel will be led by Professor Lassie, uh, Professor Mabai, Oriel Fernandez, and uh, Kenneth uh, uh, Kabagambe from the National Organization for People Living with Hepatitis B in Uganda. Uh, 